Hello and welcome to Dateline London. This week, a sacking in Washington, a timely election leak in the UK and Donald Trump's visits to the Middle East and the Vatican. Debating all of that are Stephanie Baker from the international news agency Bloomberg News, Janet Daly, political columnist with Britain's Sunday Telegraph newspaper, Jonathan Sakadotti from I24 News and Israeli News International News Channel, Mustafa Karkuti from the Dubai-based newspaper Gulf News. Welcome to you all. Donald Trump sacked plenty of would-be business moguls on the reality TV series The Apprentice, barking your fire to their face. James Comey received his dismissal as director of the FBI in a note. Getting rid of TV contestants doesn't have many consequences. Sacking the head of the country's key crime-fighting agency when he's investigating those around you, well, that's proving harder to forget. Um, Stephanie, what was he thinking? Yeah, he did not handle this well. He's not good at firing people. Um, you know, this was such a chaotic week, so let's unpack it a little bit. Yeah. First of all, the messaging was incredibly messy. Um, he trotted out various Trump campaign, you know, Trump surrogates to argue that actually this was prompted by a memo from the deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein, uh, calling on his uh, Comey's dismissal because of his handling of the Hillary Clinton email investigation. Now, no one was buying that because Trump had uh, praised Comey's handling of that repeatedly, as had Jeff Sessions, the attorney general. Um, and then we have Trump contradicting his own staff, basically, you know, selling Same them down the river. Him anyway. Yeah, uh, and that he had been planning on firing him anyway, and that actually he was thinking about the Trump Russia investigation when he had decided to do it, and and that actually the trigger had been watching Comey testify last Wednesday, where he uh, said that the notion of his intervention in the uh, election to tilt it towards Trump made him mildly nauseous. Now, that enraged Trump. Um, now, secondly, I think the, the interesting and controversial thing is the involvement of Jeff Sessions in this whole uh, firing of Comey. He had recused himself from the Russia investigation because he was a key figure in the Trump campaign. And his involvement in his uh, Comey's firing has raised a lot of questions uh, and, uh, you know, criticism from Congress. He got a bit of flat, didn't he, for saying for when it emerged he had actually met the Russian ambassador but exactly. hadn't mentioned it at the time of his, his hearings. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then, you know, lastly, Trump dug his own, uh, dug himself into a further uh, <laughs> controversy by tweeting out that uh, a thinly veiled threat uh, to Comey that he better not start leaking because there might be tapes. And that is set off a whole round of speculation about who is he taping, what kind of taping system does he have. I mean, could the Nixonian comparisons get well, any more you, stark? Well, now you're talking about it, isn't it? And the you have top Democrats uh, uh, in, in Congress calling on him to release whatever tapes he might have. Um, so, I mean, I think that this is getting uh, very troubling, and I think we, we need to, uh, you know, uh, his credibility is certainly under question. Janet, were you question, something... <laughs> to put it mildly, yes. Things had appeared, I dare I say, to have calmed down a little bit in, 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 in Washington for a few weeks, at least, in terms of... It looked like the, the, the administration was getting him into a bit of a rhythm of working, and this week seems to have thrown it all Blown it out of the water. And the thing is, it's not just... The inconsistencies and the contradictions, okay, experienced, inexperienced White House administrations often do screw up, you know, and they contradict themselves and they take back the original story. But it's the shamelessness of it. It's the absolute preposterous arrogance of it. He contradicted his own earlier account of why yes. he'd sacked him. He turned it on its head and he didn't seem the slightest bit embarrassed about this. Where does this kind of bravura sort of narcissism, how, how, how can that possibly be credible in a president? I mean, I'm old enough to remember Nixon and Watergate, <laughs> and there was at least a degree of shame and embarrassment and culpability, and when those tapes were released, the Watergate tapes were released. Of course, there were and, tapes of yes, conversations. Yes, and he was place. caught red-handed, as it were, having plotted the Watergate burglary. And then what was most shocking, believe it or not, this seems extraordinary now, but what was most shocking to the American public was the language that he used. Everybody discovered that he spoke in the most obscene sort of stream of four-letter words in his own Oval Office to his aides. They were talking like a bunch of gangsters. Now, Trump talks like this in television interviews, <laughs> I mean, well, there's something very peculiar has happened to the American political consciousness for this even to be 
um, to be not instantly impeachable. This and it is, gets to this. this is... It gets to the, the the whole issue of Nixon actually went to great lengths to to deny that mm. there were any tapes. Yes. And here we have so Trump advertising <laughs> yes, the yes, fact right. that he, and perhaps, he might have them. Perhaps making it up. Let me just bring John Nixon in then. Yes, well, I think what's interesting about all of this as well is we are dealing with a president who plays by totally different rules. They're the yeah. rules of entertainment and television. And boy, and he's, he's certainly giving us entertainment exactly. in Exactly, and he seems well-versed in those in a way that other politicians are sort of catching up. So while the media are, uh, on the whole, condemning him for these sorts of behaviours, these absurd things he's saying, they just seem so at odds with how we're used to president speaking, he's managing to hide the real issues. Here we are talking about all of that, and actually the issues that he doesn't want discussed, for example, the investigation into uh, the alleged collusion with Russia is not what we've discussed at all. On that note, by the way, I would also say that perhaps, like him or not, we need to say that there's very little concrete evidence yes, yet sure. that Can that I... has happened. And Obama, let's not forget, was also caught on a hot mic in 2012 yes. saying that he wanted a bit more time to get through his next election. And, and then, then we'll he would be able be... to sort things exactly. out. Yeah. So these yeah. are I mean... not things that politicians haven't done in the past. No. And I... he is a master of distracting from them. I just wanted to say about that, the word collusion, that's a very strong mm. word. I mean, that is implies that there was a conscious conspiracy with a foreign power, an unfriendly foreign power. That's tantamount to treason. And that's the, the idea that, but, but hang on. The idea that you actually have to, have to prove collusion makes the case really, really hard. So you think the standard should actually be low? Yes, yes. I, the, I don't think collusion Stafford, is the right word. The, the, the thing is, I noticed, I was in the state in Washington, mm. D.C. I just come back last week, talking to people, officials, and co colleagues as well. Really, the main worry is, is about democracy. What's this happening? What's impact that would leave on, on, on democracy itself? And their main worry is that society itself uh, it doesn't, it cannot guarantee uh, that to, to stop that impact in a way. He is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. They are really scared and frightened by him. This is that, really testing you know, U.S. institutions. I, I, I yeah, the but I think in that respect as well, he is democratically elected as of their course. president, even if people around this table might not like him. And he is also following procedures. Other people have been fired in the same role. Uh, it wasn't well, that long ago one. that we were hearing... One. One okay, yeah. we were hearing he was accused of fiddling his expenses and his but tax There jobs. we go. He's gone through a process which is, has precedent. And yeah. he is also somebody that... Uh, Comey is somebody that the Democrats not that long ago wanted to be fired and, for his part the in the Hillary Clinton controversy. And the Democrats a little bit awkward on this, haven't they? Because they've gone from saying this man was, uh, uh, you know, yeah, this responsible man for the, through the yes. election. To, mm. uh, one Democrat told me, he, well, he's a, uh, uh, James Comey's a bit of a boy scout. I thought, yeah. well, hang on a minute. Those <laughs> yeah, two that's, things that's that's what you want at the head of the FBI. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing is that it, it's difficult for the Democrats to agree, uh, agree because they've said previous you know, unfortunate things about him in the past or disfavorable things. But in a sense, you could read their, their interpretation of this as, as having considerable integrity. You could say, even though they've got a grudge against him and they've got grounds for objecting to him, they don't like the way this has been done. I mean, that is a legitimate thing to say. And the issue, of course, is the timing. Why did he decide to do yeah. it now? If it was really about the Hillary Clinton yeah. email yeah. investigation, yeah. why didn't, he should, it, happen why didn't it happen? And, yeah. and, there, and there is, it, it apparently is the case that Comey was about to ask for more resources to pursue the Russia connection. You know, for his investigation. I should imagine this is probably a weekend when uh, Donald Trump is quite glad to be at getting out of Washington and getting out of the country altogether, Mustafa, because he's heading for the Middle East. That's right. Um, he's this, by comparison. Doesn't, this, <laughs> this doesn't help it, him because it distracts him, presumably, from what is something much bigger and arguably with much greater consequences. I wonder from where you sit whether people are viewing this as a serious attempt to move the process forward in terms of the Israel, Israeli and the Palestinians, or whether it's just a bit of a bit of international diplomatic theatre? No, it is serious, extremely serious. That's what I hear really from the Palestinians and also from the Americans themselves. Uh, but at the same time, being in that uh, uh, shaky position internally, domestically, uh, I don't know how much that would yes. impact on, on his, his international uh, activities and policy. But uh, he's very serious. He has been talking to Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian uh, president of the authority, Palestinian authority. And uh, Abbas people are saying that uh, he is very optimistic. Uh, apparently, he did tell Abbas that he was serious about the question of pressing on uh, Benjamin Netanyahu 
to come forward and sort this out. Because, you know, at the end of the day, there is an agreement. There is an agreement between the two sides on the future. But the Israelis are hesitating in moving there. Jonathan, uh, just on the, the question of the Israeli position, I'm bidding with Netanyahu, who has been the dominant player in Israeli politics for well over a decade now, but he is still only the head of a coalition government, mm -hmm. partly because of the electoral system Israel uses. Is he strong enough? Is he in a strong enough position to take some kind of initiative? Well, historically, it has been right-wing Israeli prime ministers and administrations which have actually managed to make peace deals with Arab neighbours. So in that respect, I think there's plenty of optimism around. And I think Donald Trump uh, really puts forward a new window of opportunity for both sides. It seems that both uh, leaders have visited him in D.C. and both have come out of that surprisingly, saying that they got on very well with him, including Abbas, who came out and said that there seemed to be uh, some area for development. And that's surprising because every Everyone assumed that Donald Trump would be firmly on Israel's side. I think that what Donald Trump now has to do is exactly what we've been discussing about him before. Turn this from being a show and from being the art All of about the deal. <laughs> exactly. This is the man who prides himself on making yeah. deals. This is the ultimate deal, he says. And turn that into concrete action. He's done the first step, in a sense, by making both sides like him, something Obama failed to do over eight years. Obama really put a lot of pressure on Israel, asking for preconditions that the Palestinians requested, such as freezing of settlement building, which is something that was unprecedented, and Israel agreed to. That was unsuccessful. If anything, it emboldened the extremists on the Palestinian the, side. And, uh, and Trump, sorry, uh, just to, to complete it, Trump has instead managed in 100 days to get both sides favourable towards him and to perhaps uh, consider new negotiations. Now, if talks took place, Mustafa, the issue has always been, uh, in the past, they've been hobbled by preconditions. Are they going to be just a fresh set of preconditions? Because that's the point where people say, well, we've been here before so well, many times. Pre preconditions are really used in order not to take action. The, it is a tactful thing, ridiculous in a way, because the whole plan is quite clear. There was Oslo about 20 years ago. They agreed both sides. They sat together, they agreed on a peace plan. There were so many other meetings following that. Yeah. But it is the right-wing government in Israel which is really putting these obstacles the settlement question is very serious. Well, I think there there, there's an argument gun. that it's no. not. I mean, also, no, no, the Palestinian is. Authority uh, is paying the murderers of people what? like Hannah Bladden, the British student who so was stabbed on a tram. So the Israeli government and is paying indeed, also uh, the soldiers, well, uh, soldiers who engage in, in warfare yeah, according to international that's, norms. That's, that's but people normal. who stab British students, Christian British students on yeah, trams yeah, are see, not necessarily these, peacemakers. These are little issues. These are not... Not so little uh, for the families who lost, who lost uh, people in terrorist attacks. And, and similarly, on the other side, not little for the Palestinians who lost people but you in see, military action. They, are, they yeah. are wrongly used, in fact, to, to create obstacles in the front of peace. Can I just say that if you remember the press conference that mm. he gave from Netanyahu yes. when he first took over in the White House, it was quite absurd in the sense that he, he was saying, you guys sort it out between yourselves, whatever yeah. you agree on, it'll be all right with me, and uh, I'll just sit here and One preside state, over this. State. Yeah, whatever, <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, and I mean, that just shows the most yeah. appalling ignorance of the difficulties and the complexities in this situation. I don't think he has a clue. I mean, he may but have slightly not, more of a clue now than he did He's presumably not the points then. man. He, yeah, I mean, no. it's his son-in-law is the person who's oh, been yes, pointed Oh, yes, that's certainly true. But the point <clears> is that I think the reason that both sides might be fairly optimistic is that they think there's a vacuum mm. in the White House, and if they both play their cards cleverly enough, they so might be able to get what they want. Isn't that exactly actually what both sides uh, really needed, which is even though, his, <laughs> e well, <laughs> even though his method of saying it is absurd occasionally, what he's actually saying is that he's not going to impose things from outside. He wants to facilitate. Yeah, but he has a ridiculous way of saying things by <laughs> comparison what, what to other said, presidents. What he said it's... was, you figure out a deal that satisfies both of you. Well, there is no deal that satisfies both of them. That's the whole it's... point. And somebody has to arbitrate. And if he He's saying, well, I'm really, you know, I'm not interested in arbitration. You, you just sort I it don't out think between yourself. That. Well, that's what he said. I think he's keen to arbitrate, but he's saying that he's not going to impose preconditions mm. and, that's a and very vote the unilateral moves of the UN and the like. I suspect that, again, what we're dealing with is a president where we don't really fully understand how to read his surface appearance. What, what, Underneath what it, heard, I'm yeah, hoping that there maybe is... Maybe that's all there is, is the surface <laughs> appearance. We'll find what out. I heard, what I heard from the Americans when I was in Washington, that they are really worried about the whole situation because the entire region is in turmoil and it is flaring up. This might 
transfer to the Palestine and Israel situation. Imagine if that happened there, what is going to happen to it's Israel? It's kind of catalyst. Absolutely. Absolutely. Stephanie, what, I mean, he's going first to Saudi Arabia, which is an interesting first stop. Why? Um, you know, the first trip of a U.S. president is always loaded with symbolism, yeah. and in this case, even more so. Um, going to Saudi Arabia, the, you know, he's expected to get a warm welcome. Ironically, despite him pursuing this Muslim ban, now the Saudi, Saudi Arabia escaped uh, that, that ban, is not on the list. However, I think there are um, uh, leaders in Saudi Arabia who are keen to reset relations uh, and were... Um, disheartened by Obama's per pursuit of the Iran uh, nuclear deal. Um, you know, and we had reported this week that actually the Saudis are prepared to invest $40 billion in U.S. infrastructure, and that could also be unveiled at the same time as his visit. So he can actually sell it as a domestic thing, to, you know, to the domestic audience as well. Exactly. This is and making America great again, all of that. And so, I mean, I think the fact that he is um, warmly regarded uh, in Saudi Arabia could change the balance of power, um, you know, in these Mideast ne negotiations. I do think, largely speaking, he's going on to the Vatican, where... Ironically, he might receive the roughest reception. Yes. Um, Pope Francis to be a fly on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Pope Francis has criticized him, uh, you know, his immigration yeah. policies and the like. And then he goes on to the G7, where we had G7 finance ministers this week and, and, uh, expressing concern about yes. the threat that Trump's okay. policies poses to sort of multilateral trade uh, and the possibility that his his moves could harm global in addition, growth. In, a quick in addition to the economic uh, yeah. aspect of, of uh, uh, the. the don't forget Iran. Iran is going to be exactly. the main and really course, topic. You, and it'll be a big and part of the talk about Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Egypt and Israel, Israel, he's yeah. building a coalition that can deal with both Iran and ISIS. And for the first time in some time, those three are in relatively good terms with each other and with America. Again, something which, like him or not, is it fortuitous could be a moment, It for could Donald be a moment Trump. that needs to be seized. Okay. Exactly. Now, let's turn to a subject closer to home. It's now less than a month until Britain goes to the polls. The opposition Labour Party had its manifesto leaked, whilst in a joint TV appearance, Prime Minister May and her husband lifted the bin lid on their marriage. <laughs> Last time, the pundits predicted a hung parliament had got a Tory majority. This time, the talk is of a landslide. Janet Daly, you and I were sitting <laughs> next to each other only two years ago. Can it only be two years ago yeah. when you were proud to have been pretty much the only person who predicted that the Tories were going to win and it wasn't going to be a hung parliament. Yep. Because Are you I going to make a prediction this time? Oh, absolutely. But everybody in this dog is going to make the same <laughs> prediction, so I won't have that unique sort of... Uh, I, I hadn't met anybody who said they were going to vote for Ed Miliband. That's why I could make that prediction. <laughs> and I've met even fewer people now who say they're going to vote for Jeremy Corbyn. Um, it's, uh, well, considering that it's a foregone conclusion, the result of this election, it's surprisingly not boring, uh, partly because the Labour thing is such a kind of Marx Brothers production, you know, it's become so shambolic this week. So for pure entertainment value, you know, you keep, it keeps you riveted. But also because everybody's speculating about what happens afterwards, what happens to Labour afterwards, what happens to the Tories afterwards. Mm. What, is, what does Theresa May really believe in terms of her political principles? Is she actually a Tory or is she trying to occupy the centre left, left behind, you know, left empty by Tony Blair and blah, blah. And also, will Jeremy, the big question, will Jeremy Corbyn stay on as leader? It actually looks now as if he's intending to. And it's possible there's a lot of subterranean gossip about was this leak of the manifesto intended to undermine him uh, or was it intended to rally the militant faithful to make sure that he is allowed to stay on afterwards? What's going to happen to that space that used to be occupied by kind of soft left, social democratic opposition in this country? That's really the most serious question for the political future. Mustafa, what, 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 how are you describing this election if you are touching it at all to your readers? Well, it's uh, very difficult in a way, <laughs> really extremely difficult, because the, the, uh, the way we see it uh, happening, uh, the election system here, based on constituency in a way. It is not the presidential. Corbyn may have a better chance if it was a presidential system uh, because of his populism yes. uh, policies and all that. But uh, I, we see it extremely difficult for Labour to increase their uh, seats in Parliament. They may lose a lot more, in fact, this time round. And uh, it is... Uh, totally 
uh, uh, difficult to explain to our <laughs> leaders the situation in Britain because, you know, there is no leadership of quality on both sides, I must say, not only on Labour. Conservative leadership is not that impressive. It's not of high I, quality. I think that's very unfair on Theresa May. She's playing is a political it? blinder in this election. Oh, yes. She's yeah. stepped in to become yes. Prime Minister. Yes. She's managed to unite a party that's always been divided over Europe fairly strongly. But is that a temporary or it, permanent? Who knows? But look how well she's doing at it when it plagued other leaders. And then we look at people like Jeremy Corbyn, who, on, on the other hand, have been trying desperately to appeal to voters and to the far left and the middle ground, offering things like extra bank holidays and free tuition. It's, it's only a miracle he hasn't yet offered everyone a free puppy or unicorn. <laughs> and then yesterday telling us that he wasn't a pacifist. Well, we knew he wasn't a pacifist. For example, he had IRA. no problem with the IRA <laughs> or uh, organizations like Hamas and Hezbollah, which specialize in killing civilians. So this he is would a say man. that those were organizations that were in particular situations have been forced into a situation where they had no choice. Certainly no pacifist, though. No, I mean, no. Indeed, but I mean, he, he is not saying now that he would necessarily accept those situations in current circumstances. It wasn't that long ago he said he would invite and he Hamas and Hezbollah for tea and the that makes it comments. Well, I think when somebody wasn't leader of the party, we see their true colours. Ah, okay. And we need to then consider it Which when they give us the foreign question policy about speech. Theresa May, doesn't it? Are we seeing enough of her, what this leadership means? Because <laughs> she's talking about strong and stable leadership, but we, that's almost all we've got so far in this Well, story. in a sense, hasn't Theresa May actually done very well for a Remainer? She's now coming out as <laughs> Mrs. Brexit. Brexit <laughs> means Brexit. People are accusing her of wanting some sort of extreme Brexit. I personally dispute this distinction between the two. It's such a false dichotomy. And I think that instead, Theresa May is proving fairly consistent. She's been reliable and that maybe we could say a little bit boring <laughs> for her whole career. She's the first prime minister we've had who's not tried to play it cool. And she's continuing with the Vicar's Daughter Act. She's, it's not an act. I think that's the point. I think that that's really Theresa May. Stephanie, we, we had this manifesto leak. One might have expected rather more hostility to it than we actually got. Is kind of something changed in the, the political mood in Britain when things like renationalising the railways, uh, restricting competition in the energy market, something incidentally that even the Prime Minister wants to do, Three, two, are considered legitimate policy proposals for a general election. I think they. I think most people wrote off that, that leak right. of the manifesto as uh, of no consequence because he has no chance uh, of winning. So in a sense, the policies don't matter. It don't, they don't matter. And that's part of the reason why I find this to be one of the most boring elections uh, <laughs> I have witnessed uh, in this country. And, and, but at the same time, one of the most important, I think, uh, in decades because of the impact on the country long term uh, with the terms of Brexit being negotiated. So she's called the election just on the, e you know, just as Britain is sort of teetering on the brink of, a, of an economic slowdown, we don't know how severe it could be, while the Eurozone is just taking off. Um, and I, I So in that sense, that's the shrew politics, get it out of the way before things start to maybe get a bit more messy. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's very shrewd for her to have pushed ahead with it now. Um, and I do wonder how much of a large, I mean, it's, it, the reason why it's boring is it's just going to confirm the status quo. So the only question is how big of a majority will she get? Um, and I do wonder, will she get as big of a majority as people are expecting? Because I think, A, the expectations are that it's a slam dunk for the Tories, so why bother even going out to vote? And there's a certain degree of uh, weariness with uh, elections that we've had 2015, uh, general election, 20, 2016 referendum, yeah. um, and, and, and that the turnout could be very difficult to I, predict. I would be inclined to agree with that under any other circumstances. But the referendum politicized the country in a peculiar sort of way. People are politically hyperactive, and they're not they're not bored with this, actually. I mean, they might be bored with this particular election debate, but they're not bored with the idea of who's going to lead the Brexit negotiations. That is a matter, many people have regarded as a matter of life and death. Wait. And the idea that there could be any remote chance that they could be led into the Brexit negotiations by Jeremy Corbyn, I think that will galvanize I people. I think that's right. And this yeah. isn't actually an extremely exciting political moment for British people. For the first time in at least one generation, they've been given a direct say in the future of the country. Uh -huh. the constitutional direction it will take, and they do know that they need a, a leader who's going to uh, carry them through that. It's incredibly risky. That's why many people who yeah. didn't like the EU even voted well, Remain. So I suppose on that argument, they didn't actually, you know, they had that leader already. She was there. She could have just carried on and done But the now she's, she, she was planning that, she said. Then she saw these polls. Yeah. Then she recognised oh, that she to extend say, She didn't say that she was doing it because of the polls. <laughs> no, no, of course not. <laughs> but, you know, we but know that that will have played a part. Yeah. I mean... I, I, 
I'm already a little bit because uh, we shouldn't really ignore the young generation. Mm. I have uh, three kids. They all think different to my thinking. Mm -hmm. And they are pro Jeremy Corbyn. They are pro. And Labour. will they actually go out and vote? They will, no doubt, as I will my, uh, myself. And these are three kids. They represent, I think, a good part of the society itself. And I think we, that's, 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 that's the interesting that, sort of change in exactly. the way voters, the breakdown of the traditional alliances, yeah. instead of having class being the defining uh, characteristic of who votes for which party, it's yeah. now generation. Generation, yes, yes and no. I was out at Cambridge, as it happened the, just the other week, Briefly and uh, I won't say which college, <laughs> and I was talking to a considerable number of students, and almost to a man. They were telling me they'd voted to support Jeremy Corbyn in the leadership and they were ruining the day. They, were, they regretted it. In <laughs> well, we'll all know the outcome of that in, as I say, just under a month's time. Janet, Jonathan Sashadotti, Mustafa Karkuti and uh, Stephanie Baker. Thank you all very much for being with us on Dateline UK. Thank you for being with us on the programme. We're back at the same time next week. You can, of course, comment on the programme on Twitter. I'm at BBC Sean Lay. From all of us on the programme, goodbye. Hello there, it's not plain sailing weather-wise.